Hey guys, welcome back. For our next lesson, we're actually going to take a uh, deeper look into two of the most important resources in the Middle East, specifically water and oil. We're gonna start off with the idea of water. Water is the most scarce and most valuable resource in the Middle East. If you control the water, you control the life. Remember, you can't get anything done. No agriculture, um, no food is grown without water. And so if you uh, control the flow of the water, you've got an awful lot of power and influence. Now, in our last presentation, we talked about all the different water resources but how can you have all of these water resources but not have any water? Well, <laughs> the reason, um, so I asked you, how can you have all of these gulfs and seas and bays and oceans have access to all of these different types of water resources and yet still be so dry? That was a question you had to answer from our last lesson. Well, your answer is salt water. All of that is salt water. You can't bathe, drink, cook, or water crops with salt water, which means that freshwater resources become much more important. So when we talk about what those freshwater resources are, let's take a closer look. This is a world map of major rivers in the world. You can see uh, North America, we've got lots and lots of rivers. Uh, you can see Europe has got lots and lots of rivers. East Asia and Southeast Asia, lots and lots of rivers. Uh, South America, lots and lots of rivers. And then if you look in our specific region, the one that is circled with the red um, oval, that is the region that we're looking at. And by comparison, that region has an noticeably less rivers. Rivers are one of our most basic and most important freshwater resources. And if you are in a region where you don't have a lot of rivers, then that freshwater is going to be scarce. If we take a closer look into the region that we are talking about, now, last time we talked about how there's three sub-regions within the region we're studying, Middle East, um, North Africa, and Central Asia. This is more of a close-up into the Middle East area specifically. And you'll notice there are three. Um, part of the last assignment was to see if you could identify what three rivers there were, um, or the three main rivers in our region. And if you did it correctly, you would have identified the Nile, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. Now, you'll also notice that the Tigris and the Euphrates um, make up the region of the world that used to be called Mesopotamia. This area right here was the Fertile Crescent. And um, because it was in between these two big rivers, uh, lots and lots of really great farmable land, good soil for growing crops. Uh, and so here we have the modern day version of the Fertile Crescent. Now you'll notice that the two rivers have their headwaters up here in Turkey. up here and up here, but they drain down through Iraq and come out in the Persian Gulf down here, which means you have multiple countries that depend on these two rivers for fresh water. Turkey, um, you've got Turkey, you've got Syria, you've got Iraq. Um, knowing that you have multiple countries that are reliant on 
a couple of rivers is going to make those water resources even more important. Now, the other one is over here along the Nile. Um, we're gonna talk specifically about uh, the Egyptian civilization that rose up along the borders of the Nile. But you'll notice with the Nile also, you have additional countries that have control over what happens along the Nile River. So this right here is Sudan. Um, if you go further down, you can't see it um, on this particular map, but this is Ethiopia. And the Nile actually has its headwaters down in Ethiopia. And so if Ethiopia decided to dam the Nile, that would really make it difficult for Sudan and Egypt down the road because they also rely on those water resources. The other main source of fresh water in the Middle East is something called aquifers. Um, you guys may have studied about aquifers in um, science, but an aquifer is essentially just a big underground lake. Water drips down through the topsoil, through the first couple of layers of sediment, and collects underneath between rock, essentially. And if we know that there's water down there, then people can drill down and access that water and use it to irrigate fields, use it to fill wells for drinking water, all of that kind of stuff. So the map that you're looking at right now is essentially a map of all of the aquifers in our region. You'll notice um, there's some pretty substantial aquifers. We've got um, many up here in North Africa. You've got a big one through Saudi Arabia, and then you've got another really substantial one here in Iran. If you happen to be a country that has an aquifer underneath its borders, you're gonna be pretty lucky because it means you have access to that fresh water and you can use that to help your uh, society, help your culture progress. If you don't, then, you know, you are kind of out of luck. However, just like rivers, aquifers need to be uh, used judiciously. Aquifers can end up drying out. They can end up going um, barren if they're overused. And so the people of this region need to be very careful with that because their water scarcity is so great that they need to use the water resources that they do have very prudently. Because of that, because their fresh water is scarce, because their fresh water resources need to be used carefully, uh, and because they have so much access to different salt water resources like we've already talked about, one solution that that countries in the Middle East are turning to is something called desalination. Desalination is essentially the process of removing salt water from fresh water, or removing the salt from water to create fresh water. Sorry, let me say that correctly. So what they do is they essentially take water from the ocean, from the seas that are around them. They put it through this huge plant that ultimately filters the fresh water out of the salt. And so you end up with this residue of salt and then fresh water comes out the end. Now, if you guys are super bored and want to do this at home, you actually can. If we were in class, we actually would have a lab where we would desalinate water. But essentially what you do is you take um, a pot, uh, like a pot that you would use on the stove, you put uh, salt water in it, um, we, in class, we would just use a mixture of regular water and salt um, until the salt dissolved and then we'd put it in the pot. You would then cover the pot with um, like saran wrap or plastic wrap up over the top. You would secure the plastic wrap around the edge of the pot with a rubber band. And then you would put some sort of weight, like a rock or a um, something that's a little bit heavy in the middle of the plastic wrap that's over the top of the pot. Inside the pot, you would also need to include some sort of receptacle, a glass or a bowl um, that is empty, 
uh, that you will ultimately collect your fresh water in. You would then put the pot on the stove and turn the stove on. Your goal is to boil the water. Uh, once you get it to boiling point, you'll notice uh, that the water starts to evaporate and you collect steam. But instead of the steam just escaping into the air like it would if you were boiling pasta or something along those lines, um, the steam is gonna be trapped by the plastic wrap that goes up over the top. The weight on the plastic wrap will allow that steam to collect along the top of the plastic inside um, and then kind of gather or travel towards where the weight is waiting down in the middle. And then it will then drip into the glass or the bowl or whatever else that you have um, to collect in the middle of the pot inside. Uh, if you boil it dry, which I do not recommend, you're, you could potentially <laughs> ruin your pot and make your mother mad, but if you were to boil it dry, you would end up with a small amount of fresh water in your bowl and a lot of salt residue in your pot. Uh, essentially, that is the same process that these huge desalination plants use to separate the salt from the salt water to create fresh water. They just do it on a much, much larger scale. You'll notice in the graphic that you're looking at right now, um, you'll see the map of the world. Uh, some countries are in blue. The countries that are blue are places that have desalination plants in use currently. The, um, or extensive desalination plants, I should say that more specifically. You'll notice the kind of pillars that spike up, these little guys right here. Um, the taller they are, the more, des uh, the more water is desalinated in that region or that country. Uh, you'll notice the United States actually desalinates a lot of water, mostly on the West Coast, mostly California. Um, but the other big region for desalination, notice, is, hello, the Middle East. Um, Saudi Arabia is your big one. You've also got the United Arab Emirates, um, Kuwait's in there, uh, Iran and Iraq are both in there. You've got Northern African countries, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, they all participate in desalination because again, very, very dry region, um, very limited access to fresh water. And so they have to use the salt water that they have lots of access to and make it work for them uh, through desalination. So the first part of your assignment that goes with this presentation is to um, essentially read an article. It's on Canvas. It'll be posted under a discussion on Canvas. Uh, you will read the article and then you're going to answer the following prompts. And it's this idea of water causing conflict. Um, in Canvas, it's listed as the water fight discussion or the MENA water fight discussion. And the prompt that I want you to think about is this idea that wars in the Middle East could very well be fought over water. Now, based on our discussion today, uh, why do you think that might be? Who would be the combatants in, the, in these wars or these conflicts? Who are, who are gonna make up the, the different sides? And then think about how borders influence the issue of water availability and the control of rivers. Do those political borders matter or should they matter? Um, and how do they influence and affect the overall um, control of that water? All right, let's shift gears for a minute and talk about the other most important resource in this region, and that is oil. Uh, oil is often referred to as black gold. Um, and it is this black gold that has brought unimagined riches, riches specifically to the Persian Gulf nations. Um, here is a map of all of the oil fields and gas fields in the region, uh, specifically the region around the Persian Gulf. Now you'll notice this area right here is the Persian Gulf. Um, 
It is on the east side of Saudi Arabia. You have Iran up here, uh, sort of at the top on the east side, and then you have Iraq that's sort of at the very, very top. Kuwait's up there as well. It's hard to see with all the little green dots. Um, but these are, obviously, you can tell from the map, these are the most important, the most crucial players when we talk about gas and oil resources not just in the region, but worldwide. Um, you can see how many different oil fields, how many different gas fields are throughout this area of our region. Um, you guys know when we go to the gas station to fill up our cars, uh, that gas is often created by um, a process that um, breaks down and essentially takes the oil and creates gas out of it. Without oil from this region, the United States would be in a huge gas shortage. Now, think about how difficult it would be if you couldn't just run to the gas station and fill your tank up anytime you needed to go somewhere. Um, that's what we would be facing if we, for whatever reason, didn't have access to the gas or oil from this region. With gas and oil fields, Okay, so these are the sources of these resources where it's actually pulled out of the ground. But once it's pulled out of the ground, we have to actually get it. Another interesting component of this is pipelines. So you see the region where so people can use it. And that's what this slide depicts. These are all of the um, main oil and gas pipelines in the Middle East. Uh, the green are oil field pipelines and the red or kind of pinkish color are your gas field pipelines. Notice these are pipelines that are going to get you to places um, where the product can be shipped, okay? Specifically shipped through water, over water. And so you'll notice how many of these pipelines take you down into the Persian Gulf, how many of them take you over here into the Mediterranean. Um, you'll notice all the ones from Egypt take you up to the Mediterranean as well. Um, if they're up here, you've got some that are gonna take you over here to the Caspian or some up that'll take you into the Black Sea. Now, what's interesting to think here is, well, most of our oil and gas access or, um, origination, right, is going to be in this area. Here's the Persian Gulf. This is where our oil and gas fields are located. And yet, they're building pipelines all the way across this land to take them to all of these different water resources. Well, why would they be doing that when they can just get easier access straight down the Persian Gulf? Well, the answer is, it's a money thing, right? It's always a money thing. If I want to ship to different areas of the world, if I wanna make sure that my product, specifically oil and gas from the Persian Gulf area, um, can be sold and utilized in all these different regions of the world, then it makes more sense if I can get it to the Mediterranean if I'm headed to Europe. It makes more sense if I can get it to the Caspian or the Black Sea if I'm headed north to Russia. It makes more sense if I can get it over here to the Red Sea if I'm headed to Africa. Okay. And if I want to go anywhere in South Asia or throughout the rest of the Middle East, then it makes sense to go down through the Persian Gulf. Um, but you've got to remember that this region of the world supplies oil and gas everywhere in the world. And so these gas pipelines and oil pipelines are what make um, access and trade those exports of this product um, much more accessible to the rest of the world if we can get it to all of these different places. Now let's talk about the impact of oil. The impact of oil on the Middle East cannot be overstated. It is crucial. This is the singular resource that is paramount for regions or countries in this region being able to develop, industrialize, and modernize. 
it is the only reason they have been able to progress as far and as fast as they have. However, one thing to remember is that oil is a fossil fuel, which means that there's only so much of it. Um, it will eventually run out. So what's gonna happen to the Middle East when the region runs out of oil? Um, and what can they do to prepare for this? And so the rest of the assignment that goes with this um, presentation is to access the Middle East oil discussion on Canvas. There's another article there. Um, you're gonna read it, and then you're gonna summarize the solutions that they offer. What should the Middle East be doing now to prepare for when the oil will eventually run out? Now, there's a lot of different um, schools of thought on when that could be. Um, the rest of the world adjusting their need for oil um, by starting to use renewable energy sources like um, solar and wind and hydro, those kinds of things, um, may mean that the oil can last longer because we aren't using as much of it as we have been. But it, I mean, there's so many different variables, it's hard to say how long the oil will last. But eventually it will run out and this region needs to be prepared for what will happen then. And they probably should start preparing now. Um, because in 50 or 100 years, you're going to need to have a plan in place before, before the tanks actually finally do run dry. So, um, recap on assignments for this presentation. Um, the water fight discussion in Canvas and also the Middle East oil discussion in Canvas. Okay, um, if you have any questions, shoot me a quick email. Otherwise, I think you guys should be good to move on. I'll see you next time.